All right, how's that? Sounds much better. Okay, cool. Okay, so we're back again, and this time we are talking about the unfortunate, um, um, the unfortunate news that um, Studio Ghibli co-founder, director, and animator Isao Takahata died at age eighty-two. Yes. Which um, I was, yeah, uh, I mean, I was honestly beyond shocked when I heard the news. How so? Mainly because, you know, I didn't really... It was one of those deaths where you just didn't see it coming, you know? You know, it kind of reminds me of what happened with George Michael. When it's like, when I got the news, it was absolutely unexpected. Like, pretty much unexpected down to the bone, you know? Oh, uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I know they, like, you know, I've heard, like, as, since he passed, um, that he's been having some health problems, and Studio Ghibli says it was due to lung cancer. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I don't know, because I was just thinking that, you know, wondering what's he going to do next after making, you know, the tale of Princess Kaguya. You know, I thought he was going to, yeah, he right, was right. up another project. And now... You know, we're never going to see another project from him. Yeah, that, I guess, more than anything for me, um, it was just, it was, I, I guess, unexpected. But I, I don't know, for me, it wasn't really shocking. I mean, uh, especially hearing the age, I was like, oh, okay, you know. Um, it's still very sad to hear. Mm hmm Yeah. Now, I've only seen one of Takahata's movies, which was the really, um, powerful Grave of the Fireflies, which I still say, watching that movie, um, bettered my relation, like, my relationship with my sister. Yes, I remember you mentioned that. Mm hmm Because, you know, growing up, I was not exactly, like, I was kind of, you know, like... I didn't, um, I wouldn't say, like, I bullied my sister all the time, but, like, me and her were kind of really competitive. Like, she was always the one who got better grades. She was better at karate and swimming than I was, and my parents just kept on pointing that out. Ah. So after seeing Grave, I just kind of, you know, it just kind of just hit me that I should treat my sister better, and... Even though, you know, we definitely had, you know, good times, you know, I've been treating her a lot um, nicer as of late, especially now that, you know, she has, um, goes through depression. Right, right. Yeah. But I, it's so interesting because when you talked about grade, you brought up how, like, it kind of developed your sense of empathy. And I kind of felt like it did the same for me. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, um... Uh, for me, uh, I've mentioned a lot how, at a younger age, whenever I looked at uh, media, I never really took the time to analyze it, and I just kind of like took it in as it was and just kind of enjoy it for what it was. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the first uh, instances in which I began to see that um, you know you could, you had characters to relate to and to. Uh, feel for um, was Grave of the Fireflies mainly looking at how there was very little to look at as far as uh, comedy you right. know um, and I being a big fan of Studio Ghibli was kind of you know looking at, at, at uh, these films uh, for kind of like just sort of like a feel good type of you know easy to digest sort of story but I was deeply impacted by this, by by the uh, by the emotions in this in this film, and I think from there, uh, and well, at least from there, I began to look at media a little more uh, with with an analytical eye, and and in a sense, looking to understand what the creator was trying to say with with what they made 
Um, I, I'm not saying again that this was the first uh, instance of my having that experience, but it was one of the first. Um, and, and I think also from there I began to realize also that actions did not only impact me, uh, but other people as well. You know, so that was another real big thing that I think I, I took off from this film. And I did not particularly have any specific experience with this film other than the film itself. But I think overall I, I attribute it to one of the many um, films that I've encountered that sort of kind of added to my character, you know, just kind of like helped me... Um, develop as a person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely, in my case, I think it was the first time I saw a movie and realized that, you know, people, you know, also go through struggles and some, some of them are the same struggles I go through, if not worse. Like, and the thing was, right. I saw Grave at a time when I was really starting to watch, like, more dramatic, um, gut-wrenching movies. Like, this was around the time I first saw um, Saving Private Ryan and Schindler's List. And those three films, they kind of made me... It was the first time where I watched a movie where it felt, like, so realistic. And Grave was um, based on, like, an actual, like, actual pair of siblings. Did you know that? I think I had heard of that, yes. Yes, and I know Steven thinks that Grave is manipulative and that the original story was basically the brother apologizing that he couldn't take care of his sister. But I think, like, as far as adapting it into a three-act structure movie, I think it did it um, quite successfully, you know? And, and, I th and I think we can tell here that more than accuracy, although it, I think it does a decent job with that, the more important thing here is the emotions that were going through these people at that time period, you know? You know, because let's say even though um, it's painted in a way where you're like, oh gosh, this is a little overdone or anything, but uh, we got to keep in mind that human emotions can be overdone too, but they, they feel raw and they feel genuine for the person expressing and, and, and processing them, you know. So I think that comes into play also with, uh, in the film. Yeah, it was definitely the first time I saw a movie where, you know, it was definitely, it felt very genuine, you know. And, you know, if it developed a sense of empathy, then in both of us, I think it did more than, it's not, you know, mere manipulation, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm uh, going back to the point where you um, mentioned this being sort of like your, one of, sort of like your first film having that sort of experience with. Um, before watching this uh, Grave of the Fireflies, in fact, um, what led me to look up Grave of the Fireflies was uh, back in high school, um, I'd go over to the library um, after school in attempts to do my homework, and I would end up picking up books here and there. And I started looking into Barefoot Gen. Barefoot Gen? Which, yes, yes, they had, uh, I think, a good chunk of the volumes of the original manga there. Mm -hmm. And from there, I started looking at the uh, animated adaptations and even the live-action adaptations of the story because I just found it fascinating getting a look into uh, the kinds of struggles that they had at that time period. And from there, seeing that, um, you know, Studio Ghibli had made that, um, made a similar story, um, involving the same time period I was mainly interested and uh, yeah I think I was kind of like for me it was more I think I, as well a time period where I was beginning to look at more uh, mature uh, content and kind of just like taking in it more like I had mentioned earlier but was sort of just kind of like enjoying it to a point more where before I just I, I didn't really have a taste for it mm -hmm. but um yeah so i don't know i think i think one of the things i noticed was how in in 
Grave of the Fireflies, you can tell how um, how the two main characters that we have are kind of pushed to sort of mature extremely fast. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, that was something that uh, you kind of didn't see as much with Barefoot Gen. Though, Bare, though in Barefoot Gen, you did see that he um, he had to deal with a lot of very extreme things as well. He still kind of managed to keep um, sort of like a childish, kind of like uh, energetic and naive demeanor. Mm-hmm. While in Grave of the Fireflies, you notice how these kids are just kind of like, they're not given that opportunity, you know. They're, they're just, um, they're off on their own. And the older brother, though, he is, uh, you know, older than, say, Gen in, in, in Barefoot Gen. Uh, you know, he's still kind of like at a point where he's got to do a lot more than he than, than, you know, would typically be expected for someone of his age. And it, it, you can see how it really takes a toll. Yeah. I remember it, yeah, when he first decides parts. to move out, um, you know, he's super confident. And then, you know, as time goes on, it becomes much more of a struggle. Yeah. And I think that kind of made Grave of the Firefly stand out to me more a little. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the fact that you could just see how this was emotionally taking a toll on him. Mm -hmm. And reality Um, was just kind of setting in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know, did you want to mention, did you want to go on to one of the other films? Um, definitely. uh, I mean, even though I haven't seen, um, Takata's other work, I've definitely, I've honestly become more and more interested, um, after his passing, like, I've started to learn that, you know, these are actually the kind of movies that not only I would want to see, but they even sound like movies I would want to make. Like, um, Only Yesterday, for example, I remember, I think it was Steven that said, it's not only just, like, a character reminiscing on her own childhood, but it's also her realizing these little details, you know, now that she's older. And right, I think, yeah. I mean, did you see Only Yesterday? I haven't. But I haven't actually. I'm in on the same boat. Uh, I just kind of like. I, I just remember Stephen mentioning it along with um, my neighbors, the Yamadas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but uh, I've honestly uh, the only other film I remember getting a chance to see was Pompoko. Right. That was actually why I wanted to bring you on because you've at least seen Pompoko, right? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, I will admit one of the main factors that got me interested in this film was it's featuring, um, you know, raccoon dog characters or, uh, Tanuki, uh, so I've, I've, I've always found them really cute for the, mm-hmm. like, may, probably since high school, uh, uh, I started to look into, you know, um, you know, what are yokai a lot more, and and these guys, I just, ah, oh, I just absolutely love them. So seeing that Studio Ghibli, uh, Studio Ghibli, um, kind of had a film uh, on them, and and they even made some very peculiar references to the lore behind them. I was like, okay, I'll look at this. And though at first you might be expecting, uh, kind of like a a completely sort of whimsical, sort of like everything's dandy and magical type of feel. Um, and I remember kind of uh, Stephen mentioning this as well. Uh, there's like a, there's kind of like a, this, this sort of seriousness to it coming in with the, um, with them having to. Uh, protect the the forest where they're living from from being destroyed. Mm-hmm. And you know, you're kind of like, oh well, yeah, this is gonna be like save the forest, everything's awesome kind of story. Where you know, we get to see them save 
save their land and, you know, and, like nature prevails and all of that, but uh, absolutely not, you know. I think, yeah, Stephen mentions particularly how the ending of this film is just very bittersweet. Mm-hmm. It's so... And, uh-huh. The weird thing is, even though I've never... I saw, like, um, Jesu Otaku's review of it, and um, I also watched um, Doug Walker's review, which not going to be doing too much of that following the Channel Awesome incident, but that's a story for another time. But I just remember yeah. seeing a lot of super surreal, like, visuals. Like, I remember in Jesu Otaku's, there were, like, walking power lines, and the tanuki like they shape shift into humans and at times they look really cartoony so what's that about well um one of the main things that one of the main kind of abilities that are attributed to tanuki in uh in i think it's it's in shinto shinto lore is that uh they are shape shifters kind mm -hmm. of like uh Kitsune, where they can take uh, pretty much any form. So I think one of the main differences they point out is that uh, Tanuki usually are attributed to using a, a leaf in order to to, to, to achieve that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of what that happened, where that what that's about. And you kind of see that a little more too with the with their more primal forms that are kind of shown within the movie too, where, you know, like where sometimes they, where some moments they look like, uh, you know, legit kind of like wild animals that are out in the forest and whatnot. And then at other times they just look like anthropomorphic mm -hmm. and more cartoony. So that, that's a little bit of that too, kind of like them taking that form in order to, uh, not attract a lot of attention. Um, another one <laughs> And this is a lot, this isn't necessarily lore. This is this is uh, this is kind of like a little fun fact. Uh, Tanuki are notorious, particularly the males, uh, for very prominent genitalia. Yeah, raccoon pouches. <laughs> Yeah, um, in fact, uh, back in the day, they were used uh, for smelting gold, I believe. What? Because they, yes, they would t use these sacks uh, kind of like to to hammer, uh, to, to pound uh, gold, because they were not only very stretchy, but very tough. So they worked extremely well. Oh boy! <laughs> yeah, so um, you got to see that reference too in the movie where they they are able. It looks like um, to use these uh, these sacks to float mm -hmm. and and fly and around. Also for protection. <laughs> that too. That too. Again, going back to the fact that they are very tough. So um, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah another movie now. This is a little bit more of the uh, more uh, funnier, kind of like more lighthearted films. Mm -hmm. um, they are also um, very well known, at least as yokai, not really as animals, um, to have, an, uh, have a taste for alcohol. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's why typically when you look at uh, statues of them, they're they're holding a a sake bottle. Like they actually drink it. Well, well, they they enjoy it, so they go around looking for people to give them sake. Oh. Yeah. So uh, you can see them around a lot of establishments. Uh, I actually have one in my room. <laughs> I think I saw it before. Yeah, I, I remember I was mentioning to your dad, and he also pointed out that um, they were also believed to repel fires. Mm -hmm. So it was a good thing to keep fire, to keep from having like fire accidents and all that kind of stuff. So I thought that was cool. I don't remember that really being pointed out 
or like referenced in the film. But yeah, yeah, I just had a lot of fun looking at all these. And again, this is also one of the uh, first instances where I started to look into uh, yokai lore. I think probably the first one I started looking into was Kitane. Then, uh, or what are the what are the uh, foxes in general in Japan? Uh, and then these guys, which are raccoon dogs. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I think I think it was a great choice in in um, mascot too, because it's, from what I understand in Japan, it's kind of like a mixed uh, mixed kind of like uh, opinion about how they view these animals. Mm-hmm. Uh, because despite them having some sort of significance in, in the Shinto. Religion. Um, I believe some still consider these guys a pest. Mm-hmm. So it kind of works off of that idea that you know, like, hey, sometimes it's hard to appreciate nature, but it comes out um, having a big uh, impact, negative impact when you fail to do so. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that that's really hammered in and. And I think that was part of what kind of left me feeling a little more kind of like bad for them at, at, uh, uh, with the ending of the movie. And I'm sorry if I spoiled it for anyone. Uh, I just thought it was it was necessary to really talk about the film. Uh, mm-hmm. But cool. um, yeah, just kind of like looking at the idea that these guys were just for some reason misunderstood and not even with good reason. Uh, you know, and that costing them their home, you know, kind of like everybody's like, well, they're just mm. dumb pests. Like, why should we care if their home is destroyed? Mm-hmm. You know, we're just, we're just going to bulldoze here and just, you know, do what we got to do. Um, and I don't know. I think it kind of adds to it, too, where it's just kind of like, dang, you know, like, you know, seeing how it's really easy to just kind of, like, uh, dismiss uh, nature mm-hmm. in general, um, which I think the film did pretty well. I see. Huh. Oh, I would have expected, like, a, a happier ending. Yeah, again, like, I was hoping that, too. Like, I was halfway through the film. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, now I'm all, all pumped up to see how they fix this problem, you know, get them to see their home back, and yay! Because I've always loved happy endings, especially when I was younger. So I was like, yay! <laughs> Which, yeah, I was, I was still, I was probably like 14 or so when I watched the film. Mm-hmm. So I was still kind of at that stage where I was like, yay! Happy endings, you know, everything's cool. I love TV, it's so yeah. But I guess I know, it's kind of more realistic because, you know, technically, you know, environmental issues are still a thing, I would imagine, yeah. in Japan. Yeah, and I th- I think, I think um, it kind of left me thinking and, in a sense, pleasantly surprised. Um, not, not so because I was glad to see the ending. Um, but more so because I was like, I realized that it was it was kind of chal- it was trying to challenge the viewer with that kind of kind of be like, oh yeah, um, you want this, but you're not gonna get it, mm-hmm. you know, kind of like it don't work that way. You wanted to, you got to do something about it. Keep yeah. this from happening. Right. I think yeah, um, so I it really like, adds because wow. um, I know Jesso Otaku said that like Pompoka was really meant as a kids movie, you know. Absolutely, yeah, and uh, I think I think it's a, they 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 managed to do that really well too, like keep it a kids film, like even with the whole uh, Tanuki sex, they they mm-hmm. never ever kind of it <laughs> paint that in, in any sort of inappropriate picture. It's right. just it's just a thing they have. <laughs> but yeah, and, 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 and that made me even more pleased to think 
Because I kind of put myself in, in the kid's shoes. Like, I've always felt a lot younger, sort of, like, as far as, like, uh, mentality, not in the sense where I do not understand stuff, but just kind of like, as far as kind of like emotionally, mm-hmm. uh, kind of related a lot more with uh, with younger audiences, uh, and it was kind of good. It was kind of nice for me to see, hey, just because of this kind of personality or this kind of, uh, uh, you know, sort of like uh, emotional age. Uh, we're not being kept from processing uh, complex ideas, mm-hmm. you know? It's kind of like we're being presented them to kind of um, to kind of look at it ourselves and be like, hey. Right. Like, it could basically... Is, how like... does this apply? <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, I basically see it as maybe it could be, like, a kid's first movie where they really think about, like, the ending, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, It was kind of like a lot of people's experience with um, the the, uh, Dr. Seuss book, uh, The Lorax. I know a lot of people had a similar uh, experience with that, with the whole Wansler being... uh, it's up to the viewer. Like, he, to... you don't see his face, and then at mm-hmm. the end, where the kid is left to decide what they do with the seed that they're given, mm-hmm. um, and all that. So, that that was kind of like what I had with Pompopo. Mm, I see. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, though there are a few differences, this was definitely a little more uh, sad. You know, because it wasn't necessarily, oh, it's up to you. Like, we're not going to give you the ending. No, they're like, we're going to give you the ending. Mm-hmm. You know, just remember, this is a film, so if you don't want this to happen, you know, go do something about it. Right. Kind of a more pro It's so funny, because in the video when we were talking about John K, you were saying that cartoons are becoming more proactive. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and I, I in no way meant to imply that there were never any kind of uh, examples of this uh, I know. from earlier time periods, but we're definitely seeing them being worked off of a lot more, mm-hmm. I feel. Right. Hopefully that will lead to more people taking in those messages, which is the important part. Right. But that's to be seen. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, just like to add, um, you know, the ending of the Lorax, maybe this is just me being dumb, but do you know what I always just assumed? What? The kid planted the seed. Well, yeah, <laughs> but I think even apart from that, you want to be like, well, what happens? Does that actually fix it? Do, mm-hmm. do, do things improve? Do people follow him and to kind of like uh, join him or, or just... Does it, does it just end there and the plant dies and, you know, everything keeps right, going to right. hell? Right, right. But, you know, me as a kid, you know, I was not, you know, one for, like, you know, those kind of ambiguous endings, you know. I just thought that things just had, like, definite endings. I wasn't aware. Yeah, I, 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 I know that there are some people who just, they hate not being given a clear-cut ending. My mom, particularly, I remember uh, she hated... The X Files, particularly for that reason, because from what I understood, they never gave a clear cut ending and they just cut it off. Mm-hmm. So she was like, "What? No! I I need to know what happens next. That sucks." Mm-hmm. You know, uh, so I'm my like, video hey. editor. Um, no offense to you, um, Adriana, if she watches this, but yeah, she's kind of in that similar mindset too. Yeah, I know. I absolutely understand it, but I think with these kinds of uh, films where we're trying to uh, get people to, to um, sort of apply this to the real world, I think it's very effective because mm-hmm. of that. This is like, yeah, you don't like it. Well, go on, do something about it. Come on, take action. You got this. Definitely. <laughs> so, like, Work off of that anger. Mm-hmm. I, I find I find the the idea of, of that sort of reaction particularly amusing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry, but no, yeah. it's totally understandable. Oh. 
Yeah, it's just now yeah. I have to see Fon Poco. Yes. I mean, there's, uh, I mean, there's I definitely obviously a would lot of movies it. I should be seeing. It, it, I, I loved it. I mm -hmm. remember just loving that movie. Right. The, is there any other film we could really uh, include here as to sort of like going over? Because I, 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 like I mentioned, these are the main two films that I've seen from, mm -hmm. from him. The only two others I know of were um, The Tale of Princess Kaguya and uh, My Neighbor's Diamada. As I know, um, Takata worked on other things in between, but those are like the five films that... Um, he was very well known for at Studio Ghibli. I mean, he did work on other projects, but we're mainly going over his di directorial work. Yeah, yeah, and um, man, I, I kind of wish I had seen more. Uh, I don't. I uh, there's really no particular reason why I just didn't end up watching. Watching a lot of the other ones. Mm -hmm. Well, well, actually, I was just about to say, well, the DVDs are hard to find, but you know, you could obviously, you know, if I wanted to, I could pop, you know, Pompoko. You know, I could go over to like Kiss Anime and watch it if I wanted to. No, and especially like for me, that is absolutely no reason to say I haven't watched it because, especially back in the day, I just, I just, I, I found a way to to look for nearly anything that popped up mm -hmm. uh, as far as being mentioned. Mm -hmm. Just be like, oh, okay. And then just like completely delve into the internet and find several different areas in which you could be like, oh, okay. So finding articles, finding uh, reviews, finding copies of the video, you name it. Uh, uh, all kinds of stuff. You know, right. so I was like, yeah, no, no. If I didn't, it was just because I didn't didn't get to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't know because it's like I've the only one I've seen was um grave. I mean, have you seen my neighbors the Amadas or the Tale of Princess Kaguya? Mm, I I haven't. I I think I heard about Princess Kaguya around the time where it was um being um well like it came out. Mm -hmm. But I, I did not uh, actually watch it myself. Yeah, same here. But I guess the uh, positive thing is now we just have, like, more movies to uh, watch, like, more choices, I guess. Yeah, I'm definitely interested, you know, looking at, at these where I'm just like, wow, I'd absolutely watch this. Yeah, especially since what interested me is I used to think My Neighbors Diamadas it looked really silly. And then when I heard that um, Michael Arndt says that it was an inspiration for him to make Little Miss Sunshine. And then when I heard about um, where only yesterday when the character reminisces and she picks up on the small details of her childhood, I kind of realized, hey, maybe there is something in My Neighbors Diamadas. It might even turn out to be a movie, you know, I've the movie I didn't know I wanted to see. Yeah, especially um, from what I've gotten to see of Isel's other works, like the main two that I've watched mm -hmm. uh, with Palm Poco and uh, Grave of the Fireflies. Both, though we can clearly see at different levels, kind of have uh, a sense of maturity despite even with Pom Poco having that sort of light-hearted feel to it, mm -hmm. you know, there's all there's still that kind of sense of like something's going on. You know, um, there's something to be dealt with, something to look at. Uh, you know, it's not all just fun and games. You're just kind of like, wow. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if there was something really to take out of out of um, his other works. Yeah, it's really hard to say what appeals, like, you know, what's so appealing about, like, in particular, Only Yesterday and um, Grave, other than, there's something, I don't, I don't know if there's a word for it, but, you know, in the case of both, like, the idea of, you know, picking up on the little details of a childhood or, um, you know, being in, you know, a, um, 
a movie where it portrays um, two victims of war rather realistically. There's something really... I don't know about using the word relatable, but you get what I'm saying? Absolutely. I think, I think part of it is like kind of how one... I, I, I personally enjoy looking back at random memories that come come and come from uh, nowhere uh, just uh, about my childhood you know and then just sharing it with the people who experienced it along with me right you know and I think that's part of the appeal to it you know kind of like a reminiscing uh, and, and not just reminiscing but kind of like taking in where you started off and where you are now and how things have changed, uh, either good or bad. Um, yeah, not only reminiscing, but also noticing the little details that really emphasize um, the changes that one's beginning to notice, either in themselves or the people around them. Yeah, with the whole... Deal of looking back on on childhood memories or like uh, experiences with one's mm-hmm. family yeah. and the like. Oh, sorry about that. That came out of nowhere. Yeah, I mean it's cool. It's not just looking back, China, but even like realizing you know things you didn't understand when you were a kid. Right, and then having that that moment of clarity where you're like, oh wait, that's what was going on. I personally have that happen so often, mm-hmm. even with things that have happened uh, relatively recently. I'm just like, oh, okay, I get it now. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I definitely relate to that. Yeah, I mean, it's really crazy, but I'm just gonna have to see only yesterday to see if I could really pick up on that. So. Yeah, same. I I think I'd be interested in watching both of them, really. Uh, only yesterday and my neighbor is the Yamadas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah it's just Shucks. A matter of figure. What? What's up? My my phone is at the verge of death. All right. Um, you want to just um, you think we should just end it here? Uh, I don't know. Unless you have. More you kind of wanted to add to it. I don't really know what else to say other than, you know, I'm definitely interested in seeing Takata's movies, but I just wish I saw them, you know, while we were still alive. You know? <laughs> You're right, definitely. I'm I'm pretty much on the same boat. Mm-hmm. So, I guess we'll All just right. end it here. Um, rest in peace, um, Takata. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. All right, thank you so much for having me. Mm-hmm. I thoroughly enjoyed it every time. Yep, same. All right, so I'll see you later, Gabby. See you later. See you. Bye. Bye.